Okay, welcome everyone. We're streaming from Broward College North Campus and we're lucky to have a visiting artist with us today, Portia Munson. Portia Munson is a visual artist working in a range of mediums, including photography, painting, sculpture, and installation. Munson earned a BFA from Cooper Union and an MFA from Mason Gross School of Art, Rutgers University. She has had more than 20 solo exhibitions and her work has been shown in major public and private exhibition spaces since the early 1990s in the US and abroad, including Girls Club, the collection of Francie Bishop Good and David Horvitz, uh, the New Museum of Contemporary Art in New York, Mass MoCA, the Rockefeller Center, Museum of Contemporary Art, Helsinki, Finland, and many more. She has been awarded residencies at institutions including Fine Arts Work Center in Massachusetts, uh, Yaddo in New York, and McDowell Colony for the Arts in New Hampshire. Munson has taught at New York University, Yale School of Art, Vassar College, and SUNY Purchase. Her work consistently explores the meaning of color, the commercialization of femininity, and the environmental repercussions of consumer culture, the marketing of gender, mass production, and their cumulative effects through installations, photo montage mandalas, and still life paintings. As you absorb the work of Portia Munson, use this quote by her as a framework for listening. I want people to question and not be passive. I want the viewer to see the beauty and the horror. So please welcome Portia Munson. So I'll hand it over to you. Great, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I'd also like to add in case any of you find yourself in New York City this uh, coming July or August, I am going to be having a solo show at PPOW uh, in New York City. PPOW gallery and I am pretty active on my Instagram so um, if you don't remember that but you can remember my name then if you just you know you can just look at my Instagram you, know, you don't have to follow me but if you just check with that um, you'll see that um, uh, that that show listed there and then there's two other shows that are solo shows that are also happening up in the Hudson Valley Catskill area where I live one in Hudson New York and one uh, at a place called Art Oh My. Both of those will also be happening over the summer. So um, anyway, I'll get started on um, talking about my work. So I work in a wide range of medium, um, including working with found pink plastic. So um, this piece that you're looking at right now, this is called Pink Project Table. And I, um, oh dear, uh-oh. It's not moving to the next one. Sorry about that. I'm having a little, uh, I wonder why it wasn't doing that. I think I'll just go up to, um, I'll try doing slideshow, see if that makes a difference. Okay, yeah, sorry. So um, uh, ever since I was young, I've loved the color pink and collected it and um, was, would, was thinking about this color in relation to my identity at that time when I was a young woman, like why as a young woman is the color pink associated with me or associated with um, with uh, being a female. And so I just started collecting this color and amassing it, um, particularly when I was it really started working on that when I was in undergraduate school at Cooper Union, I would just collect any kind of pink plastic I would find. Most of it was like really discarded. I'd find it in um, on the side of on the street on the sidewalk or I'd find it in free piles or thrift shops or you know junk shops um, and I was just really curious to see what would happen uh, when it was amassed together or, or that was sort of something that I came to like seeing the amassing of it I um, I was originally doing um, why is that doing that still sorry guys I'm having a hard time with the uh, it's not. I think if you just next. bring your mouse down, the arrow key will show up probably to go to the next slide. But yeah, but I don't know. It, yeah. it wasn't happening. Let me see okay. if it'll do it now. Oh, well, maybe I'll just have to leave the sidebar on. <laughs> I can't. Uh, I guess I could try putting it back on full. Full. Let's show slideshow. 
Okay. Okay, there. So anyway, I'm going to just jump ahead for a second to an image like this. So I started, this is a painting. This is an oil painting of a pink wig, the inside of a pink wig. So what I was doing first was I was collecting um, this pink plastic to use as subject matter for, um, for paintings. And I was making these um, very simple um, still life paintings. And at the same time, I was collecting all of this pink stuff and it was taking up a bigger and bigger part of my work area of my studio. And I realized that it was a, it was a piece unto itself. So I proposed it as part of my thesis show and my advisor was like, oh no, that's a bad idea. And that's all I need to think, oh, that's probably a really good idea. <laughs> Someone's telling me not to do it. So, um, so I uh, ended up showing paintings of the pink objects and this large um, table installation. Um, and that was in, when I first showed this uh, in graduate school, it was in the late 90s. And then I showed it at the new museum in the mid, um, I mean, in the late 80s. And then I showed it in the mid 90s at the new museum. And it's just these found objects arranged together, laid out on this tabletop. And um, I guess, you know, you could sort of see it in, like a cityscape or, um, I guess I also was seeing it as kind of a self-portrait or a portrait of like these objects that were being mass produced and marketed towards women. And it was really interesting to see what kinds of objects um, came, were manufactured in this color. Uh, so it was um, mainly beauty products, cleaning products, sex toys, things for pets and things for children. And that was sort of the dominant like um, theme of what the pink stuff was. So that was really fascinating to me um, that they were all like that. And so that I, I, you know, I just was like putting like things together to try to sort of make a statement about what the stuff that's out there in our world. Um, so as I continue on with my work, I've continued to work with pink plastic. This is a more recent piece called Her Coffin. And this piece was inspired by the um, kind of inspired by the pink ribbon ca campaign, breast cancer awareness, um, which is a really good thing to um, for there to be breast cancer um, awareness and for that to be put out there. I'm not critiquing that at all. But what I was um, noticing was that so many of the pink things that had pink ribbons on them were made out of pink plastic or the packaging was pink was plastic or pink plastic and the pink ribbons and how plastic is very carcinogenic and so it felt really quite ironic that that um, these things that were you know sort of trying to raise awareness about um, a you know a tragic cancer was um, also perpetuating the the spread of plastic so um, this is a glass box filled in, I've sort of color arranged the pink in this box. And it's, it's basically a glass box that would, that would hold me. Like it's, it's sort of my dimensions or a little, a little bigger than I am. You know, I'm like five, six and, you know, it sort of is like that kind of size. And that's a detail. This is another piece that I did called Mound. It's just quite obvious in a, in a gallery, I just mounted up a whole pile of found uh, pink plastic. Um, here's another painting of um, pink gloves. And I, I, at one point earlier on, I did quite a lot of portraiture. I painted um, self portraits and portraits of, of lots of my friends and different people. And I realized that I, what in some cases was kind of inadvertently kind of insulting people or revealing things that maybe they didn't really want to be revealed about them in the paintings. And so um, I, I, I came to see that I could say everything that I wanted to say in a portrait of an object. You know, I could sort of um, talk about people without having to actually specifically show a person, but through showing um, the objects that belong to a person. 
This is called Pink Purse. And I should say that these oil paintings are, um, they're painted, I paint the, the objects the size that they actually are. So all of my paintings are relatively small. So this is, this actually, this is called Girl's Purse. And so it's, you know, it's kind of a small purse. So the painting is probably like, you know, 12 by 14 or something like that, inches. Here's a styrofoam egg carton. This is um, Pink Project Bedroom. Um, it was exhibited at the Flag Art Foundation a few years ago in New York, as well as other places. Um, and this is a, um, so first I did like the table and more sort of um, contained kinds of pieces. And then, um, and then I had sort of a, I, well, I, actually what happened was I ended up having children and um, my time became really limited from having little children. And so, um, and we were living out on the end of Cape Cod at an artist residency. And I was going, one of the things I would do every day was go by the dump because at the dump, there was something called a swap shop. And it was like a free thrift shop at the dump, which I kind of feel like, or transfer station, I kind of feel like that's something that should just be everywhere. Like every transfer station should have like a free swap shop because, because we all have thrown out something that's perfectly good. We just didn't want it or need it and didn't really know what to do with it. And it was a great way for people to like get rid of things they no longer wanted and then find something else that they did want. And it was this really great exchange. So I was quite broke and living in an old kind of empty house out on the end of Cape Cod. And I would go every single day and gather things and um, decorate the bedrooms in the house or decorate the house. It was, I was living there during the winter and it's very gray and cold and kind of dreary. And um, so I, I started um, covering the walls and ceilings with these different found things. Um, it really was focused on another installation that you'll see in a little bit called the garden. But I also did kind of start this, this one around that time too. This is this pink bedroom. So the ceiling in this are all um, baby onesies, pink onesies. Actually, they're not all baby onesies. They're just pink onesies. And the walls are uh, night, negligee, nightgowns, long pink dresses. And then the room is just filled with all different kinds of stuff that are associated with, um, with girls or women or that are marketed to them. So another aspect of what I'm doing is thinking about through gathering this stuff, like the meaning that's embedded in a color, in a color in relation to marketing and how colors are used um, to market all the stuff that we don't really need, but think we do need um, to us. So here's another view of that room, another one. I also kind of love the different sorts of messages like clean hands and face award, or I'm not sure what the one on the bed says. It probably says something like some girl world I see. Like they're just um, kind of fabulous um, or horrible, fabulous messages that are on lots of different, different things. Oh, I guess I have this image twice. Another view of the pink bedroom. Here's another view of it. Oh, so sorry. I think I have a few duplicates in here for some reason. Yeah, so I guess I also this in this one you can really see this these stanchions and the rope off the of the front of the room. This installation was actually at a gallery out in California in the Bay Area, and um, with this installation I made a freestanding room in the middle of a much larger gallery. So you could walk around the outside and look in the windows. You see, there's like there are two. There's one that has yellow on one side, and there's one that has a camera in it on the other. Like there. There are windows um, on the sides, and then the front has like a big opening, a big door, and then these stanchions. And the way I think about 
this room and the garden is I kind of think about them as historic period rooms. So if you were to go into a historic home and they might have these stanchions set up so you could see how the room was when, you know, somebody, um, you know, some famous person lived in that house. And I, um, I just kind of really liked that idea of like th this as sort of capturing this period in time because I kind of like to think of um, of all this stuff as being um, it's it's sort of the stuff of our time and the plastic and I think of the plastic as like creating like this layer of earth like a strata a layer going around the whole earth and coating the earth in plastic and how um, it's gonna, we're gonna get past that. Like we're gonna move on beyond the plastic age. And so I'm kind of just sort of documenting this, this particular moment. And I think about how um, in my lifetime, my grandparents and great grandparents knew a time when there was no plastic. And I like to imagine that my grandchildren or great grandchildren also might just know of plastic as something that is in a museum, you know, something that um, or is like a horrible thing from the past that no longer is produced and manufactured, throw away plastic stuff. Um, here's a, a, this is kind of like a quick watercolor gouache of a bra, um, a, a work on paper. And this is a purse. I've done a whole series of these kind of quicker paintings that are um, this, again, the size the object actually is. And I I like to uh, draw or paint directly from observation. So I, I, I never use a, a photograph or a screen or anything to, to see what I'm painting. I have the object right in front of me because when I do that, I am able to, um, you know, like in this case, looking for me looking at it, I can see this was probably late in the day because of the kind of blue shadows that were being created um, that I was capturing. And I feel like I'm able to get a little bit more kind of specific uh, life or like a, like a kind of a movement of the light in the work. So this is a purse, bra. And so um, I think since I'm talking to a 2D design class, I guess I would just say that um, one thing I've been enjoying when I've been uh, working on these gouache watercolor, I do gouache watercolor kind of combination. And I also um, use uh, watercolor pencils. I love using the watercolor pencils. So I'll often kind of sketch my, um, sketch my images with a pale blue or a pale yellow, like a very kind of pale color, start sketching it in and then I'll draw in with some of the watercolored pencils and then go in with the watercolor and the gouaches. And I really like how the, how the, the water and those, the pigment that I've laid down from those pencils, um, how, that, how that works. Okay, so this, um, this is a, a photograph of what's called the garden. And um, Lisa and I first met in front of the garden in Miami at the um, art Basel installation in 2019, kind of shortly before the pandemic. Um, so this um, at this piece now is up and on view in Louisville, Kentucky, at a place called 21C Museum and Hotels. So it's good for you all to remember 21C Museum. So 21C stands for the 21st century, and they only collect artwork from the 21st century. And um, 21C is a chain of museum hotels that are mostly in the center part of the country. I know there's one in Chicago, there's one in Louisville, there's one in um, somewhere in South Carolina, I'm not remembering where, there's one in Kansas City, there is gonna be one in St. Louis. They're in, a, they're in a lot of like Southern and Central cities and they're free and open to the public and they're open 24 hours a day. And so if you're in a big city, check and see if there's a 21C museum because they have, they put on fabulous shows and they're in the lobby. The one in, I've only been to the one in um, 
Louisville, I've, although I've seen images of the other ones, they have regular, very contemporary arches that are going on that are just really, really well done. And um, just showing a diverse um, group of artists and kinds of work. And uh, I just highly recommend it. So you, they're generally in the lobby. And in this one, they're also in the basement of the, of the hotel. I mean, it's really easy to find and it's, they're just, just great. Um, so anyway, this piece is on display for, until I think next December at, um, in the Louisville, uh, Kentucky 21C. And this is called the garden. And it's a, it's a room that's about like a 20 by 20 room with um, the, I guess the canopy comes down to maybe seven or eight feet. And the ceiling and walls are covered with floor length floral dresses. And in this room on the right, you can see a, a bed that's covered with bunnies and above it is a, um, is a box that um, is uh, full of bunnies that have been squished into it. And there's a uh, vanity that it's, maybe the next picture has, there's the vanity that was on the left side. And then um, the vanity is just off the screen here. And then there's like a love seat and it's completely filled with all kinds of found floral objects like fake um, fake flowers and things that are you know floral fabrics and but everything in it is man-made there's nothing nature and so it's kind of um, it's kind of like a um, it's a detail of the vanity top um, it's it's sort of a, a celebration of like life and and sort of procreation like thinking about flowers as being the sexual organs of plants and and about like um, procreation and um and also it's sort of like a like a funerary room like thinking about flowers as being something that we associate with funerals and also with life um and so with this piece i'm really thinking about that idea of um like this overabundance and all of this, a lot of this stuff came first from the swap shop that I talked about earlier out on the end of Cape Cod, these different swap shops where I'd go and just gather all this floral stuff and floral dresses and floral stuff, floral um, fabrics and fake flowers. And it was, I kind of intercede, interceded on its way to the dump, to the landfill. And um, so I'm just really, you know, kind of thinking about the horror of it. So I, I'm, I mean for this room to be very seductive and beautiful, but at the same time also kind of horrific. And what, what year did you complete that one? Yeah, so this one, um, I think the dates on it are, it goes 1996 is when I kind of started it. And then I'm calling the end um, 2019 when it was installed in Florida. I'm kind of using that as the end date because then it was um, purchased by 21C and, and it's shown there and it's it's going to be in their collection. And I think it's going to have a permanent home in St. Louis. So. Yeah, so this is um, part of my practice really is looking at the culture and gathering things like um, and it's not just anything like I, I really think about like what things are speaking to me or what things do I have a real connection to and um, or do I find like this, like with these flowers, there's this real contradiction with these fake flowers like and this this kind of idea of um, them being really beautiful, but also being artificial. And so that was really intriguing to me. And again, um, the association of flowers with women and like what's that about like women wearing flowers to be beautiful and smelling like flowers to be beautiful and um you know so i'm kind of like thinking about those kind of themes There you can see the ceiling, like this canopy ceiling. And this, um, there's this bunny, this smushed bunny container above the bed. And that was something that I also found at the 
at the dump and it was being thrown out and it had been um, the, um, the sign that went in front of a church, you know, where they put all the letters and the, you know, to say what, what was happening in the service. And so I rescued that and kind of renovated it and just filled it with all these bunnies. And I was kind of thinking about, um, just thinking about that, you know, the sort of pagan and funny kind of overlapping with different um, ideas, religious uh, ideas that were taught in, you know, through our contemporary religions and Christianity or Judaism or Islam, like these different um, notions of, um, of how things work, but then how there's always some kind of incorporation of like, of like older, like pagan ideas. And so I was thinking about Easter and how it's so funny that bunnies are so much a part of that and how that's there, you know, bunnies are, it's very much like a springtime sort of celebration and about procreation. And, um, but it's really funny that it's also been adapted by, adopted by, um, you know, a dominant religion. That's just a side note, something I was thinking about with it. And also sexualized like the Playboy bunny, right? Oh, yes. Yep, definitely. Yes. Um, yeah, so and I and there's a and there's a plastic bunny on the side there. I don't know if you can see it that I made. Like I made some of the elements or like the the um, lampshades, parts of it were I definitely made. Um, and then other parts are just um, found and put just there. Um, okay, so here's a, again, a painting. So with, with in my practice, I, I switch back and forth between like making large installations, making smaller sculptures, doing drawings. I'm actually always drawing. I'll get to those a little bit later in my presentation and painting. And there I'm kind of working on all of these things simultaneously. So this is a painting that I did while I was kind of earlier on in the process of creating the garden. And this painting's called Pink Donuts. So it's an empty donut box um, on a floral background, again, painted from life. Um, okay, so now I'm switching over to another aspect of my work. This is uh, a bat surrounded by seven roses. So as I'm going through my daily activities, I'm, you know, gathering and finding things wherever I am, which includes um, kind of somewhat perfect and but dead creatures that I find. So this is a bat that I found near my house a number of years ago, and I have um, a garden. So the roses were from my garden. And I, I collect these, these creatures to kind of mark time and um, yeah, so this is one of them. And to sort of notice the, uh, so many of the creatures that I find and birds have been hit by cars. And um, so this is a bluebird that a friend found on the side of the road and gave me. And so they're, they're these are made by, and it's in the winter because I scan, I scan them and I lay it right on the scanner and I collect whatever flowers are around. So this one here was in the winter time when there aren't any flowers blooming. And these are dried flowers that were just out uh, in the field near my house that I collected and um, made this one. Here's a woodpecker. So I guess I, I also have been thinking about how um, like we discard so many things, like so much, plastic and stuff is discarded but then there's also the kind of like the disregard for nature too that I that I'm thinking about and how it's just kind of amazing to drive around and see um you know dead creatures on the side of the road and that's um I guess I'm kind of a an empathetic person at heart and so I see these like this snake was in the middle of the road and had been run over. And I just, um, it just sort of breaks my heart. Like the, you know, that that kind of, that that happens, that that we haven't figured that out, that it's just, you know, for our convenience that this this sort of thing happens. Um, and so I guess I'm, I'm thinking about that in terms of the world and our impact on the world, like, and how having, um, a disrespect for the environment, a disrespect for these animals, a disrespect in the sense of just like 
throwing trash and like it's not just throwing the trash away but it's also the disrespect of uh, like the 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 greediness of how um stuff is marketed and presented to us so that we you can't go to the store to buy food without coming home with plastic like every time you go to the store and buy even the healthiest of food you're still bringing home a bag full of plastic because everything's like wrapped in plastic and how that's so um disrespectful and i just think about that in terms of like bigger things in the culture and how like disrespect kind of ripples out disrespect for people that are different than yourself or disrespect um, you know, for creatures, disrespect for, I don't know, it just feels like very, very connected. So I'm kind of sort of thinking about that, that all in my work. Um, this particular bird is a sharp shin talk that I found on the side of the road. And again, it's made with flowers that were blooming at that same time. And I should say that this one is um, called a cedar waxwing. And um, this one I found, this one might've just died of natural causes, although I wondered if maybe it had been poisoned by something. I don't know. I found it just in the garden on the ground. <clears throat> and uh, I just thought it was amazing that these kinds of colors of flowers were blooming on the day that this bird died. So I'm trying to kind of, I'm thinking about these as memento mori, as like memorializing and remembering this bird or these creatures that, that died and not just like, you know, not just passing them by. This is a screech owl, which is a really small kind of owl. And this is um, a northern flicker that had died um, by crashing into a neighbor's window. They have really big windows on their house. And this is um, a red-tailed fox. And, I found her just down the road. And again, I was like, when I found her, I just was so heartbroken. And I, I just was thinking like, what, like what was going on there? Like someone was driving, like on our road, there's all these pickup trucks and, you know, people probably just driving really fast at night to, you know, were they going to get a six pack of beer? Or what was the, what was the thing that was so important that was worth like hitting a fox and killing it? I'm sure it was by accident, but still it's just like so sad. And now it's kind of heartening to see things like I wish they were more common, but that there are ways to make um, bridges or tunnels for animals so that they can so that they can get across their migratory, their their regular paths, because so many of our roads have just disrupted their natural um, you know, ways of going, their paths. And this is a, um, oh God, I'm forgetting the name of it. This is the largest um, woodpecker in North America, pileated woodpecker, hit on a road in Woodstock, New York. Um, so this piece is called Lawn and it's, um, as you can see, it's just this collection of hundreds, maybe thousands of green plastic objects that I've again arranged in color. <clears throat> and I'm kind of just making a comment about lawns and about like what kinds of things we use to in our gardens and in our yards and on our lawns and how lawns themselves are also kind of a manufactured and artificial thing and that lawns um, are one of the biggest um, insecticide herbicide you know fed things in our country like there's so much um herbicide and an insecticide used to try to make the perfect lawn and it's not and it's very polluting and it's not making food or it's just kind of a status you know it's like a status thing to have a like a big perfect lawn um and i again with like with the color pink with green, I was really interested in the kinds of colors, uh, you know, what the colors mean. And with green, green, um, green is used to sell things that are associated with nature and associated with the outdoors and are sort of meant to kind of symbolize like nature and greenness. And, um, and so I collect, I just collect anything green, but it just, I've sort of discovered that through the collecting of this color. 
um, that this is the, you know, sort of what it means, what the color green means. And this piece is called Sarcophagus. And um, this piece is, again, thinking about the idea of the end of plastic and how um, I'm like preserving this plastic, this green plastic from our time and thinking about and trying to imagine and believe that at some point you'll only be able to see these kinds of cheap throwaway plastics uh, in a museum, that they won't just be like in everybody's house and in everybody's, you know, backyard and part of our stuff, that they will, um, they will no longer be manufactured and produced in such quantities. And here's a painting skull of one of the green objects. I think that skull might be in there. Oh, well, I can't see it, but um, yeah. That's a detail of sarcophagus. This is another piece. I've started making these kinds of pieces with different colors. So this one I'm calling future fossils. Again, thinking about like plastic being like this thin layer around the earth and being something that um, someday will become a, a fossil, like a, a totally thing, a thing of the past. So that's what this piece, uh, this piece was exhibited at the Albany New York airport um, and in a, like a tabletop display with glass on top. And here's um, tomatoes. And um, this, this again is going to that idea of, it's really hard to go and buy food without coming home with plastic, without buying plastic also. And it's something that I, I try to think about and challenge myself when possible to try to buy as little plastic as possible when I'm buying food. I mean, that can be really tricky in terms of, um, you know, how much you're willing to spend on stuff because a lot of times the cheaper things are in, you know, in more plastic, um, which is really insane, but that's um, our world. And this piece is called Reflecting Pool. Um, and this is a, an above the ground pool that I've filled with thousands of blue plastic objects. And I'm thinking about um, the color blue and how it um, symbolizes through collecting the stuff. I see that it symbolizes water and sort of purity and cleanness and um, all things to do with like this fun kind of water play, but made in plastic. And um, it's <laughs> that polar bear, the blue polar bear is actually an eraser. It just seems very kind of tragic, a blue polar bear eraser. This is a related piece called Flood uh, that I did out at um, Oregon Contemporary in 2018. And this piece or a related piece to this is gonna be exhibited this summer at Art Oh My in um, near Hudson, New York. And just thinking about like flood and how climate change and how our world is flooded with plastic and sort of the repercussions of that. But um, again, I mean, I feel like I'm sounding like kind of a like depressing or something, but I'm, I'm also, I feel like in our, in our, um, in this age, there's so, it's very, like, it's a natural thing that artists would be using plastic because often artists are, uh, especially when they're starting out, like, don't really have that much money. And it makes sense to just use the, the resources or the things that you can find that are just around you. And so, you know, a lot of my work partly came out of that, like, what's around me and what can I, what is it saying to me about my world and how can I use it? Um, to make my work. And so I like to think of this as also um, as an artwork that's, I would hope on some level also beautiful. So it's again, arranged in these different shades of blue.
So this is another future fossils in blue. That was part of that exhibition, also a tabletop display. And, and I like to um, think about, or I just know that each one of these blue plastic items in here is really just standing in for the thousands or millions of other ones that are just like it that are out there. Uh, and when I did this piece, um, when I did this piece flood in Oregon, I was able to, sp I spent about a month there. I had a residency at the same time. And I spent a lot of that time at one of the main transfer stations in Portland. And um, they, on the sorting line, they were saving and pulling out lots of blue plastic for me that um, I was able to use to make this piece. And learned a lot about that kind of like the process of trash. I recommend um, if anybody, if you have cha a chance, it's really fascinating to take a tour of your local um, transfer station or dump. You learn a lot. <clears throat> so now I'm sort of switching gears um, to a different aspect of my work. And this is, this piece is called Functional Women. And or functional woman, maybe. Um, so uh, this piece is made up of all these objects that are in the form of a woman, of, of a whole woman or of part of a woman and have a function. Um, and so uh, this was in, the, in a show at PPOW in New York. And it's meant to I, I hope that you can see it's meant to kind of the whole, the sculpture as a whole is kind of meant to resemble a woman, a woman wearing a full skirt, like an old fashioned, like big skirt is sort of the, the idea of that piece. Um, and so in the drawer, you can see this blow up doll. If you look in, in one of the black drawers there, you see that doll. And then this is a painting that I had done of that doll. And this, this painting is called Just Out of the Box. Um, this is a piece that is titled Nude, and it's um, made up of these different figurines and female objects in the form of some aspect of, a, of the female body, and they're wrapped in uh, pantyhose and tied around this, this um, mannequin. And she's like mannequin, like, you know, a tall, Probably she's like six foot tall or something on a pedestal. There's a detail. In your collecting, do you ever come across functional men or is it, do you see a ratio between like how many objects oh, that are functional yeah. women compared to? That? Yeah, it's actually very, very rare to find a functional man, <laughs> which <laughs> is kind of funny. Um, they're almost, oh, they're almost all women. Sometimes I should have, I should have gotten, I should have, I, the last time I saw one, I was like, oh, I should really do a little mi mini sub collection of these things. Have you, have you researched where that kind of started this idea of like objects that were made out of female body parts or like, I mean, does that go way back in history? Is that like a recent consumerism thing? Um, well, I, I would say I've definitely seen them going back a, a couple hundred years, you know, in our kind of uh, Western culture. Um, and I'm sure it's, it is probably just related to consumer, consumerism, novelty items. And it's also connected to like, you know, a lot of the early ones are also kind of um, somewhat degrading to women and um, definitely sexualized you know, and sort of like these, these sort of ideal, idealized ideas about women. Um, yeah, and also another thing that is really interesting that you'll see in this other piece of mine is that so many, the majority of the, of the, uh, of the ones that I find are also white women and they're, or they're all white and they almost always have um, Caucasian kind of features. And so they're, also kind of talking to a certain kind of idealized, very Western, very white idea about what beauty and what the idealized 
female or femininity is, which is also quite um, troubling. Um, so uh, I do, I've now have over a hundred, many, many drawings of these functional women objects. So this one is a nutcracker and all of these drawings are on um, basically eight by 10 pieces of paper. And like the paintings, they're done directly from observation. So I have the object in front of me and I'm, I'm you know, drawing from observation. This one's called broken eyelashes because someone had broken off all of her eyelashes. It's a vase. This one's called lips, <clears throat> big sipper. So I guess in a way by doing these objects, I'm sort of pointing them out, but I'm, and I'm also sort of trying to like take them back, like sort of um, pull them into a different context or, you know, uh, cause, a, cause you to have sort of a second look or a different idea about the meaning of these things and yeah. This one I found in a Salvation Army, just like that salt and pepper holder, the salt and peppers were missing. A mug. And how do you choose which ones to draw or paint? Is it what disturbs you the most or? <laughs> um, I'm really just trying to almost catalog many of them. Like I'm not, I'm not so much, um, you know, there, I, I, I draw or paint almost any that I find, you know, and they, yeah, and some are much more disturbing than others, like this one. <laughs> but um, it just seems like I'm kind of like making, um, almost like making an archive or a, you know, like record a recording of all of these objects. And there's also something about like these objects are sort of novelty and in a sense, like, kind of sh cheap and sort of naughty objects. And um, by paint drawing them or painting them in the way that I'm doing, I'm sort of taking them back and kind of transforming them into, into a different kind of art. Um, I don't know, there's something okay, about that. Something more precious. Yeah, kind of making them more precious. Or more high art instead of kitsch, like. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Kind of thinking about that. So the show that I have coming up in New York, I'm going to be showing at least 50 of these drawings all in a row along one wall of the gallery. Um, and they'll be next to this piece, which is called Bound Angel. And this, this is covered with lots of figures that are um, white that have been tied with rope or bound. And I guess it's it's kind of a piece about um, about this idea of cultural expectations around around beauty or the role of women or um, you know it's sort of like looking at things that are can be easily passed over or easily just sort of ignored you know like a, like little tchotchkes that you might see in somebody's house or something but um, but when you you know put them together you're seeing sort of this. Um, comment on you know what it means to be a woman and i'm kind of looking at that and questioning that notion and just thinking about how we are all kind of bound by different um different expectations like the different expectations that society can place on us and that it can place on us also in subtle ways just through the objects that are mass produced and that are uh, that are available where we are like what kinds of messages are coming through with like the idea of you know Cinderella or the angel on the Christmas tree or like what you know these different ideas or the mannequin or different ideas about beauty 
And um, here's another related piece that's called a serving tray. And I'm making a whole series of these serving trays. This one is called Nightstand. And it's, it's found figurines and lamps. And I think of the cords as being just as much a part of the piece um, and this night table with drawers. And then this is another new piece. Um, I'm not even exactly sure what the title of this one is yet, but it again, I'm hoping that you can see that it's in the form of a woman like wearing a really big skirt. Um, she of course is missing her head. And then it it's covered with lots of figurines of women. There's all different kinds of figurines, but many of them are figurines of women wearing these large pink dresses. And again, the sign, like the different kind of words like her her banner, her beauty pageant banner says feminist on it. And the sign at the bottom says today will be awesome. Like I just kind of love the different things that uh, I just find that are in pink. And I think this might be my last slide. This is um, just a photograph in my studio from a couple of days ago. So those are some of the watercolor gouache paintings that I just have pinned up on the wall right now. And then the serving trays that I'm working on. Um, yeah. So um, Lisa, can you, is there, can you, is there, are there questions? I'm wondering what, if anybody has observations, questions, comments? Yeah, sorry, I was trying to get back to my mic. Um, did anybody think of a question yet? Oh, Tony, go ahead. Just speak loudly. She should be able to hear you. Um, I did have a question. What, why do you think there is such an emphasis on like femininity and all the stuff that you've shown or these different representations of femininity? Why do you think there's such an emphasis on that? Could you hear her? Why yeah, why is there such that? an emphasis on the female form or on, on femininity? And you mean do you commercial objects specifically or like in objects culture? And, like objects in culture in general, because it's everywhere in almost every culture. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't I don't really I don't know if I have a really good answer for that, except I mean I'm sure that <clears throat> part of it is just connected to a natural um drive for procreation you know it's probably like connected to that to just like you know actually we're sort of born with the you know where the purpose is to like procreate and to keep making us to me keep making more of us so i i would imagine that has some underlying um uh thing to you know to, to do with it and um i i don't i don't know i mean i think that a lot of the I mean, I guess, you know, beautiful, quote unquote, beautiful bodies are considered de desirable. So that is something that is saleable. Like it's something that makes stuff more easy to sell. Like that's just sort of the classic idea of like the beautiful woman standing next to or driving the car to try to sell the car. So um, yeah, what do you think, Lisa? Um, yeah, I think I was going to say the same thing that it seems to me like it's related to attraction or this idea that um, supposedly women are, are supposed to be more attractive. And I think that does go hand in hand with your idea about procreation that that's supposedly why women are, are um, considered more attractive. But um, I feel like it does have to do with the sexualization and objectification, you know, ideas of like the fact that women um, have been kind of belittled as lesser in that way that it made it easier for, um, you know, advertising to sort of uh, treat women like products in a way, the same way that you can look at racist memorabilia in history, um, where there, you know, people of color were turned into like characters or um, uh, 
like to help sell something. Um, so I think it's just the idea that when somebody is considered lesser, they often become turned into uh, the sort of dehumanized in that way. So I, I think that what you're getting at is like a dehumanization of um, the gender specifically. And I do feel like, um, you know, as our culture is sexualizing men more, I am starting to see a few of those type of objects appear of men as well. Um, but definitely, <laughs> historically, we see a lot more um, mm -hmm. specific to the female gender. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there uh, is definitely a shift happening in the culture too, which is which is kind of good like, that there is a little shift. It's slow and subtle, but yeah. Other questions people have right away? Yeah, uh, Joey. What got you into collecting? What got me into collecting? Um, I guess maybe that's the kind of thing that I think it has to do with, I guess maybe that's sort of a natural thing that I was born with possibly, but um, I also feel like it has to do with um, trying to make order out of the world and trying to understand things and, you know, pulling together the things that you like and then arranging them like I feel like for me it's it's collecting but it's also about like trying to arrange or make order and understand the world you know so it's like pulling things out from the larger world and then putting them together to try to you know make some sense out of things like sorting and curating and yeah do you remember yeah. what some of the first objects you collected were as a kid or? Um... Oh yeah, definitely. They were pink things. Like I collected, I collected pink things and um, just. Did you consider yourself girly or were, did you like the pink or did you feel like you were supposed to collect pink? <laughs> oh no, I loved it. I liked it. And I wanted, and I wanted to be, I liked the idea of being a girl and being considered like so I liked that association and it wasn't until I got to college to Cooper when I started to look at it with more of a critical eye and really thinking about like what does this mean and you know and could see like different aspects of it that felt kind of um belittling or demeaning and also then with the pink table you know how um it's you know it was kind of incredible that the kinds of things that were made in this color that were associated with me as a woman just seemed sort of outrageous, you know, that it was these just, cause I was collecting anything in that color and it was, and that was plastic and it was just like all very degrading things, <laughs> mostly. Or childlike, like, yeah, associated uh, child. with childhood. Yeah. yeah, like toy, toys for little kids that were, the same toys were marketed in pet stores for dogs as they were for children. And even this, you could find the same exact things. Um, they were cleaning products, beauty products, sex toys. Um, you know, it was like a very kind of narrow things for Valentine's Day. Like it was a really kind of narrow, specific window of types of things. Yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead, Basenja. Could you hear this? She said, what do you do with all the plastic after it's been shown in the museum? We well, probably show them more than once, right? But she yeah, might be asking I know, about your storage. Uh <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, so, and I have to also sometimes limit myself and be like, that's enough. <laughs> like, don't, I don't get any more. But I, um, I actually have, I do, I save it. And I, I live um, in a rural place on, on, you know, I have a few acres where I live. And so I have these, um, these large metal shipping containers. I have three of the large metal shipping containers that I got used that were pretty cheap and they're, they're waterproof and mouse proof. And so I, I, I store stuff in, in them. And, and I, I had considered when I was in Portland, um, leaving, like putting that stuff back into the transfer, you know, into the, dump and kind of leaving it there but then I did decide to bring it um home and now it's going to be shown again it's kind of it's somewhat problematic because one of the big um issues in terms of the environment is 
uh, the shipping of stuff and what kind of an impact just the shipping of all of our junk from all over the world to how much, you know, what an effect, what effect that has on the world to be shipping stuff like really ridiculously on, you know, tchotchke little throwaway things all the way from halfway around the world to here to sell at the dollar store. It's just kind of crazy. Right. But so nice if, if you were living in New York City, you wouldn't be able to work like this, right? <laughs> like in, That's you know. right. No, I, it would be, it really, um, I am fortunate or unfortunate, I guess you could say that I'm able to, <laughs> to save all this stuff. <laughs> right, when do you decide when the, when the piece is done or does it keep growing? Uh, yeah, or the yeah. series. Right. Um, so I was curious how long uh, it, it took before you sold your first work or transition into what you considered, you know, being a full-time artist or professional artist, like going from school, you know, since we're talking to students thinking about, um, you know, did it take long before you sold your first piece or started making an income as an artist? Um, well, I've kind of, in a way, I've kind of always sold work, not necessarily enough to be able to support myself on. Um, and I would say that it's much harder to sell work like well, this one you're looking at might not be that hard to sell, but like one call it like the flood or even the garden, like pieces like that, you're not going to find very many people who can or want to buy a piece like that. So it's much easier to sell drawings or paintings. Um, that that's just, a, or, or the photographic work that I showed you of the birds and the flowers, like that kind of work is much, uh, much more saleable. Than, than these kind of accumulations, especially accumulations that are basically, you know, organized trash. <laughs> so um, I, like my first, well, I had a show, I had my first solo show in New York when I was about 30. And I'd been out of graduate school for maybe two year, two or two or three years. And, uh, and at that show I sold, I started selling work. So yeah, so I've, I guess I've been kind of, I, I think of myself as pretty much a full-time artist um, since, yeah, since I was like around 30 years old. But I also, uh, a lot of artists are also teach, you know, I've taught quite a bit too, because that's, that's sort of a natural way to um, supplement uh, an artist's lifestyle and, and with an income. Right. And speaking of storage and sales, the garden was an example of one that you held on to in storage for a long time before. Yes. It was it 20 years before you showed it again and sold it or? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And kind of reworked it. Like I, I sort of brought it back to life because I felt like maybe it was more relevant. And I actually, one thing that I often say that I didn't say in this is that uh, uh, what I like to tell students is that you know, some of my best work has come out, has come from making work for myself. Like I never would have made a piece like the garden thinking like, oh, I'm going to make this because somebody's going to really want to see it and they're going to want to buy it like that. that That's I just, really true. Yeah. What, a lot of, a lot of people worry too much about that, like gearing their work toward sales or toward who's going to buy it, you know. Exactly. Cause you just, the you can, some of the, 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 I think the very best work comes when you're making work that you're really excited to see yourself. So you're making it because you'll be, you know, you're like, you're the first yourself is the very first, like most excited audience for what you're making. And then, you know, and then it can kind of grow and go from there um, rather, than, rather than an imagined audience. Going back to your photographic work, I, I saw the press, um, some of them would call them mandalas. Is that a word you associate with it or that other people did? Um... Yeah, I think of them as, as mandalas. I think of them as, because um, I started by, by using just flowers and I didn't put any of those into this, but um, I, I started by making flower mandalas. And the reason I started making those was um, like mandalas are something that are very centering and kind of celebratory and beautiful. And so the first one that I made was after someone close to me died 
and um, they were much older, but I was, I was, and it, and it was the right time for them to die, but I was um, really thinking about like the fleeting nature of lives and the fleeting nature of flowers and um, sort of the passing beauty in all of us and also in flowers. And so rather, I'm not a writer, so rather than writing some note to the family, I, I made this um, flower kind of tribute that had just kind of come to me in my mind. And so I sort of, um, all, all through making these flower mandalas, I, I really think about them as, you know, honoring life or like celebrating life and also memorializing life. Uh, does anyone online have a question? We have a few more minutes. Uh, if anyone online wants to either use their mic or put it into chat. Um, anyone else here have questions? Anything you're curious or what do you say? I have a quick. <laughs> do you, uh, Portia, do you have a favorite piece or series that you've worked on yet? Um, well, I'm I'm really involved in this one right now, this Bound Angel um, body of work. So I'm I'm kind of excited about this. But I guess I guess my my favorite. It's hard to say. I love pink and I like the making stuff with the pink and I love and I also really like like I feel like my own work has informed my way of looking at the world too. So um so I really like like making the pink work or making the garden and then uh thinking about my work I kind of I love going and like wandering around a Walmart or going and wandering around um the Goodwill or something because um you know, it all, it's all really interesting together. Like the stuff that our culture makes and then what we throw out, like all that just is a really interesting commentary on who we are. So I like thinking about all that kind of stuff. Yeah, for me, the going to the thrift store is like a hunt or an adventure, like, you know, yeah. <laughs> for looking for the things that, that you like, or just visually, it's like, you know, eye candy to me to look at all the different things. Um, I agree. I love it. And it's really interesting. Like when I was in Louisville, setting up the garden, it was fantastic to go to, they had these things, I don't know if they have them in Florida called peddler shops that were in old defunct Kmart's. And they were just filled with like booth after booth of people. They were like little yard sales all together in this huge warehouse. And it was just, it was just amazing. It was like the best place. <laughs> it was incredible. Well, it's interesting to me that you choose to still do drawing and painting, you know, even though you you're known more probably for your installations. Yeah, it's true. Um, and uh so is it that you just like really enjoy the contemplation or the like hand more handmade craft process of, of painting or drawing um, instead of just working in installation? Or is it partly to have like, you know, smaller items to sell or um, what keeps you driving it at that aspect of it? Um, so I feel like the paintings and drawings are much more meditative and it kind of like slows my mind down to, to sort of look and think at them, think about um, the objects, but it also is um, a way to kind of focus in like so many of my installations are just like, you know, it's all it's about the mass. It's about the mass of them all. And with the paintings and drawings, it's a real like, you know, honing in on a singular a singular object and pointing it out. So I feel like there, there's different, you know, through through showing those different things, I'm you're able to see different, different, uh, like think about things in a different way, and I'm able to think about things and process it in a different way. So speaking of process, kind of thinking about the future, do you feel like you're going to go in different directions or continue in a certain direction in the future? Um, I think I'm going to, I mean, I'm hoping to just kind of continue on the same path that I'm on. I'm, you know, I'm right now I'm doing all those bound um, pieces, but I'm at the same time, you know, I'm all set up. I just got myself, um, a, a, a new scanner because my old scanner had gotten all scratched from putting all kinds of rocks and stuff on top of it and I just got a new one so that 
when I, you know, when someone finds or I find an, another creature, I'll be able to do a scan. I love, um, you know, I'm hoping this afternoon to spend some time just like sitting at my kitchen table because it's such a rainy, dreary day working on a drawing because that's very calming and very focusing. Like it's a really wonderful kind of mindset mm -hmm. you get into when you're really just like absorbed in doing a very simple drawing or, you know, a simple task like that. Um, so I kind of imagine like continuing working in all these different ways. I'm a little hyperactive and so, um, or I can be, so I really like having lots of different kinds of work that I can do depending on my mood. You know, I can, I can go and, you know, bind an object or do a drawing or <laughs> like work in these different kinds of ways. And I like to stay, I think it's really important to stay, uh, to stay open and to not like box yourself in too much right? in terms of what you might work on, like just to let yourself be open to, you know, who knows a new thing. Like I had no idea a number of years ago that I would ever make these kinds of scanned works, but I do. Great. Well, thank you. Um, so any last chance for anyone else that wants to ask questions, whether online or here in front of me? <laughs> well, that that was really uh, insightful to see all the different series and the ways you worked and, you know, to see how ambitious you get with, um, I mean, I assume it's spent, you spend hours or days installing some of these pieces. Um, <laughs> and uh, so- yeah. with, Installations, do you plan out much of it or kind of figure it out as you're installing as far as where all these objects are going to go? Um, um, like, I, I've been really thinking about that because I'm going to do the blue flood again soon. And I was what so what I was just describing the curate to the curator how I do it. Like, I'll I have these much larger pieces, like almost all of the work has like different um sort of things that anchor it, like different anchors. So there are different larger pieces and they kind of show me where everything else is gonna go or like the large bound angel piece, the large table with all the white bound figures and the lamps. The lamps with the lights become like the, the markers. So I set those all out and then, then work from there. Yeah, but they do, they can take a long time. Like this, this took a good 10 days to install this piece this uh, pink bedroom. And, you know, sewing much longer, like sewing all the onesies together and constructing the room that it went into. Great, well, thank you so much for your time, Portia, and for sharing your process with us and um, uh, just, um, you know, it's really amazing to hear hear more insider knowledge of how all this comes together, um, because <laughs> definitely we, there's only so many artists working, you know, that ambitiously as far as these large scale maximalist <laughs> installations. Um, so we look forward to seeing what comes in the future as well. Uh, but thank you for your time today. Yeah, thank you so much. It was really great to have the opportunity to share my work with all of you. And I really appreciate it. And I wish you all of you the best with your own um, art endeavors. And it's good to just like stick with it, like just keep doing it and don't pay attention to what people might say. <laughs> just keep <laughs> doing it. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to hear you say your advisor gave you a different opinion on <laughs> yeah. you knew you, you knew to uh, to trust your own voice instead yeah. um, because yeah sometimes advisors are maybe biased or going by um, their own interests instead of what maybe might be best for your work so right and also the history without that. yeah without really thinking about what might be coming next so you have to sometimes oh right yeah like <laughs> at the time you were making this you were among you know some of the first artists to work this way yeah. Um, you know, and there are more artists working that way now, but, um, you know, you kind of pay, help pave the way for that uh, because it was probably still the painting as a popular, as the most popular medium at the time when you were in school or. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. All right. So, well, um, okay. enjoy the rest of your day. Okay, you too. Thanks so much. Take All care. Right, thanks. Bye. Bye.